Hey you guys, it's Brett. Thanks for dropping by my channel. So today I want to uh, talk about February books read. 14 books. That's 14 books I also had in January. I, maybe that's my new magic number. I don't know. Um, for whatever reason, I'm getting through a lot and that's great because um, it just means more for me to share with you. So um, some old stuff, some new stuff, some about to come out stuff. So uh, let's talk about it. All right, so before I start, I just, I want to give a shout out to a book olive. Um, she is fantastic, and I want to say to her thank you, and I so appreciate her shouting out my channel as well as um, a bunch of other books to grammars, um, which is something that she regularly does, and I think that's just absolutely so cool and really amazing and certainly it's opened me up to other people that I might not have found on this platform so um, thank you again to her I really appreciate it and for all of those people who are here now because of her um, thank you for coming thank you for staying um, hopefully I will continue to put out content that you're gonna like to see and that you'll stick around but I can only hope that one day you know, I'll have a following like she will, and I in turn will do the same thing that she's doing because I think it's very generous and really cool. With that being said, let's get into the books of February. First of all, I have to say, um, for the first time ever, really ever, I read virtually my entire TBR stack that I set out to read, save for one, which I pushed off into April for completely different reasons that had nothing to do with not getting to it. The last one that um, that I'm in, that I'm not going to finish, that I wouldn't have finished before the end of the month is All the World Beside, All the World Beside by uh, Gerald Conley, um, which is which I'm really enjoying, about 100 pages in. Um, Gerald Conley wrote the nonfiction book Boy Erased. And this one is set in Puritan New England and a minister who... Uh, finds himself falling in love with another man. Um, it's not the Scarlet, the Scarlet Letter, but it's a big H. Anyway, so, uh, but I'm enjoying it. So, so that's what I'm currently reading now. All right, so I want to start with Feeding Ghosts by Tessa Halls. This book comes out on March 5th. And uh, thank you to MCD Books for this. This is a, a, a graphic novel. Actually, specifically, this is a graphic memoir. I don't typically read many graphic novels, but then they send this to me. I loved the cover, and the it sounded intriguing, so I dove in. It's about three generations of um, Chinese-American women. Basically, Tessa Halls is telling the story of her grandmother and her mother and herself, ultimately. Her grandmother was a journalist in Mao's China who wrote a book that was banned in China. She had a fling with a Swiss diplomat, which ended up in the birth of her mother. Um, both of them escape to Hong Kong. Eventually, they get to the United States, but in the process, her grandmother has a mental breakdown and really loses her mind, so her mother is taking care of her. And it's kind of this world that Tessa Hall Halls is born into and grows up in. Um, so it's this story about mothers and daughters and generational trauma, as well as having this massive background about Mao's China and what that looked like and what they were escaping from, the histories of her grandmother, of her mother, trying to come to common grounds with her mom, who she is very different from. It is heartbreaking at times. It's an incredible story. It would have been an incredible story had it just been a, a regular book. But the fact that Tessa Halls put it all into pictures is just truly incredible. Some of the imagery is amazing. I really can't speak highly enough about it. There were moments when I almost thought it would crack under the weight of its own kind of self-examination. And it's a lot of that. And it's a lot of um, kind of a, a, a mental flushing, for lack of a better way to say it. But it's took her 10 years to write this thing. It's it's quite an achievement. And I, I think it's, it's really, really, really fantastic. So that's the first. 
Okay, next, um, Armistead Maupin's Mona of the Manor. This also comes out uh, March 5th. Okay, I'm a, a huge Tales of the City fan. I've talked about this before. I mean, th those were some of the best books as a gay man. But I just think, generally speaking, they're fantastic books. And if you've never read the series, uh, do yourself a favor. They're, they're, they're a timepiece, but they're also so wonderful. This is the 10th book and the last book, according to Armistead Maupin, in the series that he plans to write. Um, he is on the Gays Reading Podcast on the 5th, which is next week. Um, and it was such a supreme treat having him on. This book specifically centers around Mona. For those of you who are familiar, familiar with the world, um, this is Mona's story and where she's ended up. Um, it takes place, though, in the middle of the series. It's not like at the end. It's, it, it really firm, um, roots itself firmly in the middle of the, of the 10 books. Um, so know that going in and there are characters from the Tales of the City world who come into it, but she's now um, living in the English countryside, running a manor uh, with her stepson, so or her adopted son, sorry. It is um, delightful. And I will say like the last few Tales of the City books, I didn't feel that way about. It was kind of like, oh, this is nice, but not quite. This feels very much a return to form to me um, and close to the closest in terms of um, the books that came after the original uh, six books, feeling like that kind of world. So if you're a fan, you don't want to miss this. If you've never read Tales of the City, just pick it up, check it out. Um, it's also a great miniseries, um, the first two seasons. Uh, it was on Netflix for a while. I don't know where it is now, but it's, it's really, really, really well done um, with Laura Linney. And Olympia Dukakis, it's a great cast. So there's that. And check out, if you have read it, check out Gay's Reading next week for that interview. Okay, Chris Bojalian's The Princess of Las Vegas. This comes out March 19th. And thank you to uh, uh, Double Day for this copy. So um, I did not like Chris Bojalian's last book, which was something about a, um, I'll tell you right now, um, the Lioness, about a, you know, kind of film star from like the 50s who goes on a safari with her family and madness ensues. I just felt like I was, it was a little, um, it felt very movie of the week to me, something you'd see like, or even like a Netflix movie. But, and I never saw, and I never read The Flight Attendant. But he also has a million books. The guy is completely prolific and I know has a huge following. All but to say, I really loved this. I listened to this on audio. The, it's it's so much fun. And maybe it's called like right place, right time. Maybe I needed something that was going to be like a palate cleaner and just a good time. And that's all of what this is. It's about um, a woman who is a Diana impersonator who is set up at a residency in Las Vegas at a kind of um, a, a little bit trashy off the route, off the main strip. Um, casino that's kind of almost on the verge of going under. The two owners, these two guys that are the owners of the casino, are murdered at the beginning of the book. So before long, it's a mob story. She kind of gets pulled into it, and she has a sister that she's slightly estranged from who is involved with a new man and has decided to move because of this guy's job to Vegas. And so they uh, reconnect. All of it is all tied together. Um, it's really fun. It's really fast moving. It's, I think it's also because I'm, I'm currently in the last two seasons of The Crown, like behind, and I'm so obsessed with Elizabeth Debicki that I kept seeing her while I was reading this, but it, it great. It pokes fun a bit at the whole Vegas scene. Really, 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 uh, I really just, I really enjoyed it. And again, um, it would be great on the audio if, uh, you're an audio person. All right, then The American Daughters by Maurice Carlos Ruffin. This just came out last week. Um, I liked a lot of this so much. Here's my problem with The premise of this book is a young slave girl in New Orleans who is, um, she and her mother are slaves uh, and her she and her mother are separated. She meets this young freed slave who is part of 
what is called the, the Daughters, and they are a group of freed women who work to undermine the Confederacy. I was like, oh my God, and she gets involved. Sounds fantastic, sounds like spies, whole thing. Well, yeah, kind of, but my problem with the book was that part of the book doesn't come on until three quarters of the way, at least halfway through. So what the book really is, is it's at the first part, a young girl's coming of age, being a slave. And for that part, it's very well written. I didn't have a problem with it. Um, I don't know that it was, you know, gosh, I haven't seen this story before, except for the fact that it's a mixture of um, freed and enslaved, enslaved people kind of coming into contact with each other and what that was like. But um, so it, it's a good book. It's not a bad book. I just think it's a misleading book. And I really wanted more of the daughters. I wanted more of what they were doing, how they were doing it, and kind of that world. And that's what I thought this whole thing was going to be. And so it wasn't. Um, and so I just think it was a little bit of a mislead, but not a bad book by any stretch of the imagination. Um, just not what I thought. Okay. The Sleeping Car Porter by Suzette Mayer. This won the 2022 Scotiabank Giller Prize. I thought this was so interesting. It's about a um, black porter in 1929 named Baxter who works on a um, train that crosses the Canadian continent. So much of it is about his life and much of what this life of a porter is like. He is getting by on very little sleep. We slowly start to learn about him and his background, that he's queer, that he had some kind of relationship with a man previously. But at the same time, he has faced with the, his, his kind of life is interrupted constantly by doing his job as he continues to lose sleep. What I loved about this and the writing style of it, it's incredibly claustrophobic and, and, and you feel everything that Baxter feels in terms of the way that he describes these um, passengers that he's dealing with because the train gets stuck at one point. So it's all of the same people. It's a really interesting character piece. It's also like, I loved this guy. I loved this character. I loved following him. Um, so, and it reads really quick. I think it's like less or just over, um, just over 200 pages. So, you know, it's not a plot-driven novel at all. It's a very much a character-driven novel. Um, and so I know some people have been like, oh, there, nothing really happened. I actually thought a lot happened, but it's a very kind of internalized thing. And so you start to think, what is going to happen to this guy if, if he doesn't get time to sleep? So really, really, really interesting. How We Named the Stars by Andre and Odorica. Um, this is a mixed bag for me. This was one of the books that Granta had put out of one of the, the, the 10 authors to watch in 2024. And I thought that the writing was really beautiful in this. First of all, let me put it this way. I thought the first half was great. It's about a young gay man from Mexico who ends up going to school in Ithaca, at Ithaca, and his roommate and he strike up a friendship that slowly develops into something more. So I thought the beginning of this book was so beautiful in terms of what he was discovering about himself, how he was feeling, how he was starting to feel towards his roommate, the questioning of like, oh my God, do you feel the same way about me that I feel about you and all of these things. And then somewhere along the way, it became a young adult novel to me. I don't want to give anything away and I don't, but the second half of it um, just fell short for me a bit. And I found myself by the end feeling like the tone of it changed quite a bit. And what started off as kind of a very uh, sweet kind of longing book in the vein of Call Me By Your Name or Countries of Origin became a much more, a little bit more twee, a little bit more um, young adult. That's frankly all I could say about it. So... Um, it's okay. I didn't love it, but I, I I would say like four stars for the first half and then three stars to the last. I never give stars, but anyway. 
James by Percival Everett. This comes out March 19th. And thank you to Doubleday for this copy. Guys, this is so fantastic. Um, first of all, for those who don't know, this is Percival Everett's story about James, the slave from Huckleberry Finn. I was very careful how I worded that because Percival Everett has said in interviews, this is not a retelling. This is giving a character his due. And boy, does he ever give this character his due. If you've read Huckleberry Finn and you don't have to have read Huckleberry Finn to read this, however, it certainly enriches the experience. Um, what I did, because it had been a while since I read it, as I just went on to Wikipedia and reread the Wikipedia entry about it, which will give you the basic um, kind of tentpole moments throughout Huckleberry Finn, many of which this will follow in the beginning. Oh my gosh, the imagination that's set loose here and what he does in this story is so fantastic. He has created like an instant classic in its own right. Um, I'm so excited to see what happens with this book. I, I'm absolutely sure that it's going to be nominated for a myriad of awards, but really smart, really creative, really moving, uh, and takes that original template of a story and puts a very modern, real spin on what was happening. So, great book. I finally bought some Jordans by Michael Arsenault, and um, thank you to Harper One for this. Uh, this, this comes out March 13th. Michael Arsenault is an essayist who has one of his previous books, which I haven't read, which I own, is um, I Can't Date Jesus. Wait, is... Yeah, I just checked behind me. It's behind me. I Can't Date Jesus. Um, his essays center around being black in America, about being queer. And so this is the first time I'd ever been exposed to him. And I really, really, really liked these essays. He's really smart. Um... It reminds me a bit of, um, a little bit of R. Eric Thomas. It's a little more somber than that, a little more serious than that. If you're someone who enjoys essays, you should definitely check this out. Um, I really, really liked it. Providence by Craig Wills. This is out uh, April 13th. Okay, so I thought this was book was really good. Here's the thing. I think that the cover, while it drew me in, I absolutely was like curious with this cover. After I finished the book, it almost, um, how do I say? I don't want to say cheapened the book, but I do think it, it, it diminishes what's a really good story. And, and by that, I mean, the story is about a professor at a liberal arts college, a small liberal arts college on the East Coast, who um, has his own shit going on. A student comes in who uh, he takes an interest in this professor. Before you know it, a completely inappropriate affair has started. You know that something's going to happen. You just don't know what it is. And I absolutely don't know what that happened for, except to say, Yay to that. Oh my gosh, that is hilarious. That was so crazy. Obviously, my thumb thinks that this is the book you should get. But um, so there is a, you know, it's it's very rightfully rightly pitched when they've said that it's kind of talented Mr. Ripley, and it is, because we don't know anything about this kid. You know that he's headed for some kind of disaster, and you want to say, you know, Stop, don't go through that door. Um, something bad is going to happen, so you're waiting for it. But it's really smart. It is... I love a campus novel anyway. Um, so a lot of this really, really worked for me. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I can't say enough positive things about it. Like, is it the best book of the year? No, but is it really fun? 
and twisty and um i don't know i was kind of with it the whole time i wanted to see where this went um and uh yeah i don't know what i would do for the cover but um obviously it worked to bring me in but i don't know so there you go okay benjamin stevenson's everyone on this train is a suspect um so for those who've read everyone in my family has killed someone you're getting more of the same here this is his murder on the oriented express the character from the first book is back in the second and on a uh train that is carrying a bunch of mystery writers for kind of a uh you know a book uh, a mystery book um weekend on this train and people start to die it's it's totally fun and if you liked the first one you'll like the second one that said I got a little bored. Part of it was I was listening to this on audio. Perhaps my attention span was not where it needed to be. I started to lose track of people. I started to not care. Everything is intact from the first book in terms of his sense of humor. Um, all of it. And, and, you know, the fun part of this was he kind of blasts authors, readers, uh, book groups, Goodreads. So... It's clever, and he's definitely clever. Um, I don't know that this is a series that I necessarily need to continue with. Like, two, I get it. I'm just not kind of like, oh, I, I definitely need, you know, everyone in this castle is, you know, a killer. Uh, whatever. So if, if you loved the first one, you're going to love this because it's more of the same. If you were not a fan of the first one, probably the same. And... Uh, if you haven't read them, I think you could read this without reading the first, although there's enough that drops in this that you'd probably want the information from the first one just to have it. So um, there you go. All right. This book is really interesting, and I'm really interested to see how it's received when it comes out just in the general public, if it's going to be a big book. There's always that kind of thing, right? Um, a short walk through a wide world. This comes out... Um, April 2nd, I believe. Okay, so this book is a little crazy, and they're saying for people who loved Addie LaRue, um, and if you loved Addie LaRue, you might like this. And I liked Addie LaRue fine. I liked this more. This is a weird book. It's about a woman who's st struck with a, I would say curse. It's not an illness. But it's more like a curse that she has to continue moving from one place to another any place she stays for too long, she'll end up dying. And and it, it, it presents itself as, you know, she starts to get weak. She starts to bleed out of her orifices. It's a mess. Once she starts to move, it clears up almost immediately. As a result, she can't go back to anywhere she's already been. So when she's younger, she has to leave her family and she starts on this journey. It's all about her surviving, literally going around the world and the people she comes in contact with and her relationship with those people. Um, when I was in it, I was like, I, it, it immediately sucks you in. Immediate, like right away, which is what immediate is, Brett. But, um, and there was parts halfway through which I was like, am I still really into this? Like I was questioning certain things. And there is an element of this. You have to check your brain at the door because you think like, okay, just the basic premise, right? However, I was so into it. And I got to the end and I like started... <laughs> To cry my eyes out, which I never expected to happen. And I did not realize I was becoming as invested in this as I thought I was, but I was. And I, I immediately wanted to talk to somebody about this because there's a lot to discuss. So um, yes, it is a fantasy somewhat, but, but what she goes through when she's with all these people is not, it's not, but there is definitely a magic quality to this story um but i think this could have a really wide appeal um i ended up really really liking it so put this on your list to check out if any of that sounds interesting um and thank you to avid reader press for this um then going back a few years the absolutist by john boyne this is the second boyne book i've read this year the first was water last month I've had this book forever, and so I told you all that I was doing this 12 books, 12 months thing, and somebody, this is one of the books that uh, I chose, or they chose, based on the number of people. 
again, like I cannot, I, I should just be like, I'm going to get a shirt that says like love Irish writers and John Boyne. I loved this a lot. And it also very much brought me um, feelings of Alice Wynn's In Memoriam. Very similar, not very similar, but similar in that it's both the same war. Um, it's two men in the war who have a relationship, but very different circumstances. And this begins after the war has taken place and our protagonist, who is um, has scheduled a lunch to meet the sister of the other guy to give uh, her back all of her letters that she had been sending her brother during the war um, because her brother died. So then it goes back to the war and you kind of find out what the story was and what happened. Uh, it's really, really good. He, 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 he's just a really excellent craftsman in terms of plot, in terms of character. Um, there's no, John Boyne doesn't make anything easy. He doesn't make anything neat. Um, it's all very messy. It's very complicated. It's very sad, but I was, <laughs> totally there for it so um i have a pile of his other books i'm going to slowly start to try to work through over the rest of this year um that i've just had that i want to that i want to read so i can say i'm a completist (laughs) um but a really great book all right i just finished this yesterday the wager david grant this had obviously tons of end of year um kudos it was the barnes and noble book of the year um the wager a tale of shipwreck mutiny and murder david grant wrote uh, killers of the flower moon and when i finished this my first thought was well this is going to make a phenomenal martin scorsese movie um that said guys I was a little bored, and again, listen to this on audio. Maybe I'm having odd, uh, you know, um, problems comprehending things, or just can't stay in it because I just was like the story itself. You know, it's about a uh, a ship called the Wager that goes out to um, to to stake its claim and get fortune, and crashes, and it's on an island. The surviving members of the crash are stuck on this island, which basically descends into Lord of the Flies, um, and then. A boat arrives back with half of the guys who say, you know, we've survived this. And then another one um, arrives soon afterwards saying a different story. Saying, you know, they just have differing stories effectively. Um, But that's even so minor. The bulk of the book is what happens on this island. Um... The story itself, interesting, like once we're in it, but a lot of the beginning of the book is talking about ships themselves and the people that are going to be on the ship, all of which are minor characters because it's not even a long book per se. So I had trouble keeping track of who was who and part of it was, do I really care? Um, So listen, I know a lot of people love this. I might have had a different experience if I just read it and but for whatever reason, I just completely started to check out. So um i wouldn't bet on this wager i know i had to say it isn't that terrible isn't that terrible that is like such a bad dad joke um but i'm uh, please let me know if you loved it below or tell me why i'm wrong and um again and i can completely accept that it could be because i read it i listened to it and didn't read it and i don't normally have that experience but maybe it's the non-fiction thing i don't know all right so the last thing which i read was Adnan by um Linnea Axelson. This is translated from Swedish. Uh, And it is a multi-generational tale about um, two Sami families, indigenous families, uh, and what happens over time, how they become displaced about colonialism. Here's the thing. It's an epic poem. And it's now I say that And I also will shout out, this is not a poem that says, you know, the world was cold and I felt old and then we went outside. It's, it's, it's not that. But that's pretty good, right? Um, It has definitely a rhythm that's 
I found very easy to get into. It is pretty spectacular in what she manages to convey and tell in so few words. It is a exercise in brevity that gets top marks. Um, it's incredibly moving. Um, I didn't know anything about the Sami people. So again, it's incredibly informative. And it's something that you can read literally in two sittings. It doesn't take a long time to get through it. I found it incredibly compelling. And once you were in, um, very easy to stay in, very easy to follow, but a really, really, really beautiful book. Again, I would expect this to end up on some lists this year. Um, perhaps the Women's Prize. I don't know. We'll have to see. But um, yeah, really interesting book. Okay, guys, so that is it. 14 for February. Um, I have some really fun stuff that I'm planning on reading for March. So I hope to have that for you next week. Um, as always, thank you for stopping by. If you stuck with it to the end, thank you for that. Um, I hope you're all having a great week. And uh, I will see you all soon. Thanks.